Welcome everyone. This is Discussions with Speculative Poets. I'm your host, Wendy Van Camp. And today I'd like to introduce our poets to you. We have Vince Gutera, Mary Soon Lee, and Akua Leslie Hope. We are all poets from the SFPA, which is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association. Um, the uh, SFPA is a national organization for speculative poets, and we will be discussing what speculative poetry is in the panel shortly. Um, we have a system of awards that are granted to poets. We have contests. Uh, there are publications that you could submit your speculative poetry to, and if published, you are paid for your poetry. Um, it's a great organization to uh, be a part of as a poet, um, and I do urge you to look it up. The website is sfpoetry.org, and I don't want to wait too long on that because I'd like to get to the meat of this panel. Um, I'd like to start out with the poets introducing themselves to you. Uh, Vince, would you like to go first? Sure. I'm Vince doTERRA, and I um, I am a professor of English at the University of Northern Iowa, and I love dragons. My dragon is doing a funny thing. You can see through, through, the, through it to my, to my fake background. But anyway, um, and I uh, used to edit Starline. Uh, I edited that for about three years, and Starline is the um, uh, print journal of uh, the uh, SFPA. All right, thank you, Vince. Uh, Mary uh, Sue Lee, would you go next? Sure. Um, I write both fiction and poetry, and in the poetry I write mainstream poetry and science poetry and speculative poetry, and I will try to stick to the speculative poetry part of my life tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And last but not least, Akua Leslie Hope. Hi, I'm Akua Leslie Hope, and I love dragons too. And I write both poetry and fiction also, as, and poetry other than speculative poetry, and I too will try to focus on that. I wrote my first speculative poems in the sixth grade, so you can start at any time to do it. I've created a speculative poetry reading series called Speculative, speculative Sunday. Say that fast twice. Now, I hope everybody checks out that series. And I'm currently editing a uh, speculative poetry collection by BIPOC creators called Nambono. And I'm going to put in a quick bid for people who write. I'll be editing an issue of Eye to the Telescope, which comes from the SFPA. And that issue will be focused on the sea. So if you've got ideas about speculative ideas about water or the sea, please keep that in mind. And thanks for being here. And then I guess uh, I am last here. Uh, I'm <laughs> Wendy Van Camp. I am a speculative poet. Um, I have a uh, poetry collection called The Planets Out. And I'm also a poetry anthology editor. My first uh, poetry anthology came out just this last April for National Poetry Month. It's called Eccentric Orbits 2, and it features poets from all over the world. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to go into too many more details because I'd like to get this uh, party started. Um, our first question is going to be, how would you define speculative poetry? Um, Akua, would you like to go first on that one? She called on me because I start off um, every session of the Speculative Sundays uh, reading this definition, but I, I, I'll add a couple of ideas. The first literature was in verse. The Ramayana, the Mahabharata, Gilgamesh, Iliad, Odyssey, Beowulf, and that was poetry and it was speculative. Speculative poetry includes alternate history, cryptids, monsters, cyberpunk, cyberpunk, dystopia, fairy tales, Fabulism, fantasy, folklore, futurism, horror, magic, mythology, occult, paranormal, robot, science fiction, shifters, slipstream, solar punk, space opera, superheroes, supernatural, sword and sorcery, sword and soul. 
steam, funk, steam, punk, time travel, post-apocalyptic and weird and more that I have not yet named. Ah, it's a great, uh, great definition. Oh, um, before we go any further, I just wanted to throw out to the audience, we're going to be doing a question and answer session toward the end of the panel. So if you have questions for us about speculative poetry, please type it into the Q&A section of the Zoom and hopefully we'll, we'll get to you toward the end. Um, Mary Sue Lee, would you like to talk about how you would define speculative poetry? Well, I do like Akua's definition a lot, but if we want to be really succinct, <laughs> I'd say it's poetry that assumes a world other than our own. Of course, there's a whole can of worms in what poetry is, but I'm assuming we're not going to get into that. <laughs> That's true. And Vince, uh, how about you? How would you define speculative poetry? Well, <laughs> Aku and, and Mary have, have pretty much covered all the bases here. Um, I guess I will just say that, that uh, for me, it's uh, science fiction and fantasy and horror poetry. Oh, great. And just for myself, I would just like to point out that fiction itself, prose, has genres. Uh, you, there's crime fiction, there's science fiction, there's fantasy, there's horror. Speculative poetry is simply a genre of poetry. So if you think of it that way, it's kind of an easy way to do it. Um, next question. How did you get started writing in this poetry genre in the first place? Um, Mary Sue Lee, would you like to go first? Okay, so the very short answer is that I used, or well, the shortest answer is I used to run a writer's workshop and one of the members started bringing in some poems in addition to fiction and then I thought I'd write some. But, you know, the long answer is something about, you know, when I first started reading poetry, when I was given the Oxford Book of English first when I was seven or um, coming to America and the Gulf War, delaying me getting a work permit. So I ended up writing, but, you know, I don't want to take up the whole panel <laughs> on how I started doing it. I will say that I did spend about almost a decade writing mainstream poetry um, after the birth of my daughter. And when I went back to writing speculative poetry, it was one of the most wonderful transitions I've ever had. <laughs> It was great. <laughs> um, Akua, Leslie Hope, would you like to go next? Well, as I mentioned, I wrote my first speculative poems in the sixth grade, but I didn't call them that. They were just poetry. And I was inspired, I think back in the sixth grade, it was Poe and the poem Jabberwock. Mm. So those between reading Edgar Allan Poe and that poem Jabberwocky, I wanted to write like that as well as writing like Gwendolyn Brooks or County Cullen. Um, so for me, it was a long, long time. Uh, I did not get any of that poetry published until the 80s, though my first poems were published, non-spec poems were published in the 70s. So for me, there's always like these twin tracks of um, non-speculative poetry and speculative poetry. And, um, you know, what's that old, which, which, um, which tiger do you feed? Which bear do you feed? You know, um, that's kind of how it is for me. Oh, well, thank you, Akua. And Vince Gutera, you are next up. Um, how did you get started writing in uh, po in poetry, speculative poetry, to be more specific? Right, I, I do write uh, all manner of poetry. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I have mo most recently been specializing in speculative poetry, but I've been writing poetry for a long, long time, um, several decades. And I do remember, I, and I wrote science fiction uh, uh, prose. You know, science fiction narratives uh, for for probably all of that time as well, maybe 60 years, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not that long, 50 years, let's say. And um, I do remember as a teenager discovering a book that I'm sure all of us remember, Holding Your Eight Hands, which was an anthology of poetry, and maybe the first 
you know, speculative poetry anthology. But, but I only discovered um, the SFPA maybe six years ago, something like that. And it was great to finally have a community and it has really encouraged me to, to continue and to, to uh, expand, you know, what I'm doing in speculative poetry. Oh, excellent. Well, I, I might as well tell my little story too. Um, I really was not a poet. I did a little bit of poetry in high school and then I went into completely different directions. And uh, one day, I, gosh, this was maybe eight, nine years ago, I happened to be at a local con and I was in the art show and I put all my art in the art show and I wanted to stick around for the ice cream social. I mean, it was that simple. And I just happened to sit down on a bench and beside me was a placard that said sci-fi coup workshop. Mm. And I went, what the heck is that? And I figured, you know, it's air conditioned inside. Why don't I just go in and get myself a glass of water and it'll help kill time. So I sat down and there were a couple of people in the room and I went, oh, well, the, at least there's a few people here. So I got a glass of water and I sat. And next thing I know, a lady comes up to the front. She goes, I'm the sci-fi coup instructor sci-fi coup is science fiction themed haiku and she looked at me and says I guess you're my only student I guess I'll go ahead and teach the class anyway to you and I went, wait a minute what are all these other people in the room there's like six or seven she goes oh no no those are my friends they're all national magazine editors they're here to support me you are the only student and I kind of went oh my god so but I sat there I felt bad for the lady because if I left she couldn't teach to the class so um, I went ahead and I did the entire workshop. And at the very end, she says, now I'd like you to stand up and read your poetry to the class. And I'm going, what class? <laughs> I'm the only one there, right? So I did, I stood up, I read this poem, the first poem I had written in over 20 years. And then I sat back down. And the instructor did a little um, kind of um, critique of it. But as she did that, one of the publishers leaned over and whispered into my ear, I love your poem. I want to buy it for my magazine. And she slipped me a card. So literally, I sold my first poem that I'd written in about three minutes after I read it for the first time to anybody. And I went, damn, this is pretty damn good. I need to write more of these things. And now here I am, a speculative poet with a book. And I hear I'm editing and all this kind of stuff. So that's my start. And uh and I'm only a speculative poet, to be honest. I really, that's all I write. Uh, eventually, maybe I'll write some other stuff, but I love science fiction and that's kind of what I'd like to stick with. Anyway, let's get on to the next question. Wendy. Wendy. Oh, Wendy, I'm sorry, Ben. Could I, I tell you just a quick story about, uh, about Mario Puzo? You know, this is a story about discovering one's, one's genre, right? Okay. And so he wrote uh, the, the screenplay for uh, The Godfather, Without knowing anything about screenplays, you just he just wrote it, and you know, and it and, and it, it's it's you know you know it's what it ended up as as we know today. And uh, so one day he he thought I really ought to find out how to write screenplays. So he went to Barnes and Noble, and he and he picked up a a, a book a, a textbook of how to write screenplays, and he looked inside and the. The sample best screenplay in there was The Godfather, and so he said, he thought, "Well, I must know what I'm doing," and he never worried about it again. <laughs> I like that. That's a great story. <laughs> anyway, um, our next question is: uh, Where would a new poet look for a speculative poetry markets? Um, I think Vince, uh, you haven't gone first yet, so why don't we have you answer that first? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, the SFPA as a community is a great place to find, uh, to, you know, to find other poets and to talk to other poets about, about speculative poetry. Um, and then the, the SFPA, we've had a mention here already, uh, has two journals, uh, Starline, uh, the print journal, and, um, and Ida the Telescope. Starline uh, prints four times a year um, and uh, takes, uh, uh, submissions from uh, you don't have one doesn't have to be a member to submit to to, uh, to Starline, and um, oh there we go, <laughs> You're, you've disappeared, Aqua. <laughs> and um, and uh, then I did the telescope. It's a thematic uh, magazine. Uh, every issue has a particular uh, bent, a particular theme. This most recent one uh, was the Weird West, and. Uh, uh, 
a year ago we had a sex issue. And so <laughs> maybe, maybe people would like to check that out. Just Google either the telescope. Well, anyway, um, let's see. Uh, Mary Sue Lee, would you like to answer that question is where, where would a new poet look for speculative poetry markets? Well, Vince mentioned too, but um, sfpoetry.com, the SIFPA website does actually have a list of paying and non-paying um, speculative poetry markets, which is a shortcut. Um, then there's, you know, submission, online submission places like Duotrope, which you can si search, you can restrict your search on that type of um, engine um, and say you're interested in fantasy or poetry or whatever. Um, I also consider mainstream markets that don't explicitly say they don't want speculative poetry. Some of them will say we don't want science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and with mainstream markets, I, I try to send them, say, if I'm sending them four poems, I'll send three mainstream poems and one that is speculative, but maybe speculative poetry that might be acceptable to a mainstream place. So not too, I don't know out there, not too inaccessible is perhaps the word that would be best. Um, and that I think that's, yeah, that's, oh yes. The other thing is if I read an anthology, like say the Rising Anthology, which covers a whole lot of poetry from a given year, they're the poems that people um, recommended for the Rising Award, then if I find that there are several poems that I liked, I normally look at where they were published. And if it's somewhere that I wasn't aware of, I try and find out if they're open to submissions. Of course, sometimes they've already folded or whatever, some tragedy has occurred, but it's another way. And that, that way you know that at least you liked some of their poems too. Great. And Akua, uh, where would you recommend new poets to uh, look for uh, markets? Every place already mentioned, but I wanted to mention two more. So um, like Duotrope, I use Submission Grinder, where you can also ask, as Mary said, um, do a search based on the particular genre and type that you're looking for. Um, and for those who may already be using Submittable, Mm -hmm. C-B-M-I-T-T-A-B-L-E. Um, any number of mainstream publications uses that, but Submittable also allows you to do that kind of search for particular markets. So I wanted to add um, Submission Grinder and Submittable to that list and also urge people to, yeah, help us push the envelope. Uh, unless someone says no, send it. Um, because you might get a yes. Yeah. That's very true. Well, thank you, Akua. I, I actually have a method that hasn't been mentioned yet. I'm surprised. <laughs> um, basically, I um, look on Facebook. There are several Facebook groups that are for on call for anthologies and for magazines. Um, and some of them are specifically for speculative genre. Um, and I basically have subscribed to these groups and Whenever they uh, pop something in, I check out my notifications or I just go there like once a month to see if there are any new calls. I've actually been published not only with poetry, but with science fiction stories this way. Um, and I've been finding it to be a great resource because sometimes they don't bother with submittable or the bigger places. And so the pool of people going in to be published is much smaller. Um, I also think you should publish um, your work as a reprint on places like Medium or Vocal, um, because I've actually been invited to anthologies to um, put my poetry in by the editor because they've read my poetry on Medium, liked it, and then went forward and contacted me. Um, always remember, put your stuff out there where it can be seen. Um, always try to get paid first, of course. But um, once you've gotten that first paycheck, there are a lot of reprint um, avenues available to you where, you know, on Medium, I'm actually making money with my poems again, because whenever I get viewers, I, I get money from Medium. But also, it's really valuable just to be seen. And uh, so I recommend that. Oh, and one more thing. Um, SFPA does have a um, 
uh, email that goes out once a month where people put where they've been published, wherever they have been on uh, in person, on the internet, in magazines, and they list where they've been published. I find it a great resource to find new places that way because if they publish people I know, they may publish me too. And you know, the funny thing is when I started publishing um, my uh, Far Horizons, I was a regular poet there for many years. And I started putting that onto the list. Next thing I know, many SFA, uh, they, they started following me there. So suddenly we had a whole new uh, group of poets and the uh, editor got real excited because, oh, we now have a poetry section because it wasn't just me, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. So uh, never, never discount the power of putting the word out about you as a poet. And I know when you first start, it might seem daunting, but just hang in there, be persistent, and I think you'll see good results. All right, I think we can go on to the next question. Um, what additional skills are useful to write speculative poetry? And I think, Akua, you haven't gone first recently, so why don't we start with you? Additional skills additional skills. Um, what kind of skill sets do you bring into your poetry I'll, I'll, beyond I'll, just writing? I'll, I'll, start with, I'll start with what I think are basic skills for, for um, creating poetry, which is you must write daily if possible, and you must read daily if possible. So the best skill that you can bring to my mind is your diligence and your persistence, and then your education. And I'm not talking about going to school or even taking a workshop. I'm talking about reading as widely and broadly as possible. I've had the incredible privilege this past year of being introduced to an incredible array of vibrant creators through is Speculative Sundays. Um, if you're tired of reading, I invite you to um, go and listen to some of the recordings and videos of these great creators. But it's been so informative and educational to hear to hear these other voices and um, and read them because before I have anyone on, I try to get their book and read their book. So I've, read, so I've been reading a lot of different poets and it's, it's to my mind made my work better. I mean, just saying this spring for the first time in my life, I've had like 30 pieces published. And I think that's from what happened to me last year when I started being even more rigorous about reading as widely as possible and as diligently as possible. Well, thank you, Akua. That's, that's very good. Um, Vince, how about you? Um, what additional skills do you bring to the writing table as a poet? Well, first, uh, something outside of poetry writing as such uh, is uh, paying attention to, uh, to the news to what's going on science-wise. For example, lately, the last week or two, uh, we've had a lot of, uh, well, the, the government seems to be now admitting that there are UFOs. And so <laughs> that's perfect, you know, that, that's perfect for- uh, Long run. Oh, in fact, in fact, Obama the other day mentioned Area 51. So it so, seems like there, there's a, you know, there's a, a time now for, you, we've got a window here for, uh, for UFO poems. Um, and there's all kinds of, of, of science stuff happening and science fiction stuff happening uh, 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 all the time. As far as uh, poetic skills as such, uh, I would recommend um, uh, writing in, in rhyme and meter and form, which is what I do. And, uh, uh, you know, there are still people among us who, who, who think that that's old fashioned, you know, and it's, it's really the, the new hip thing. Cool. Well, Mary Sue Lee, how about you? Um, well, I agree with a lot that Vince and Akua said. Um, I especially, I'm not sure if, I don't know if I count it as a skill, but I think reading widely is very important to all kinds of writers, whether or not they're poets. Um, it's important to read 
watch your writing, that type of material, but also to read other material. Um, and on a level that's to do with getting poetry published, as opposed to writing it in the first place, I think some organizational skills are very helpful because with poems in particular, as say compared to novels or even short stories, if you put in the time, <laughs> you will end up with a lot of poems. So you need to have a scheme for what's happened to this poem? Have I sent it out? Did it get rejected? Where did I send it? And it's, you need some discipline and you need some discipline to know where could I send it? And, you know, have I got something there already? And did they ever buy anything from me? Did they take <laughs> a year to reply last time? Um, so that's helpful. And, you know, even organization of, ideas, like jotting down ideas that you have, but then being able to find them later when you're looking for them. So organizational skills are good in addition. Um, and sometimes specific knowledge is very helpful. So if you undertake a particular project, for instance, <laughs> I wrote haiku for the elements of the periodic table, and I did, yes, <laughs> you know, look up information on the periodic table, and I bought some books that were related to that um, because I knew I was going to be looking at it repeatedly. Um, so, but sometimes you just read a book on, I don't know, <laughs> a period of history or something, and then it leads to something that you write. But the other way around, you know you're going to write about a particular topic, you should definitely read about it. Oh, that's very good. You know, I use a lot of research in my poetry as well. I have a whole tickler file system to bring ideas to me. But I, I think additionally, I'd like to bring in my life skills mm -hmm. and the emotions, my emotional connection with things. Uh, one thing I like about um, the sci-fi coup that I write, that's kind of what I'm known for, um, it really sets an emotional stamp on a specific time and place. And this time and place or this emotion and connection can translate into stories later or into novels um, when I write the poetry first. And it's almost like a stepping stone into a new world for me. Um, so I like to use um, things that I've learned from the outside world. I mean, I've been like a television producer, director. Some of that comes into my poetry. I'm a certified gemologist. So sometimes a lot of the knowledge that I learned there comes through, but also a connection that I have with the earth or with spirit. And it's learning to train your mind to these connections. And I really think it helps your poetry connecting with uh, your fellow human being. But that's just my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, our next question is describe your writing process and why you find it important in the poetry writing. And let's see. Uh, oh. I, I think actually I haven't gone first yet. So maybe I will do that at least one time here. Um, my writing process usually starts with developing a theme or an idea of what I'm gonna write. Um, so I will pick out um, things from my tickler system. These are scientific journals that I subscribe to. And if whenever I find an article from that is interesting, I pop it into pocket. That's, that's my storage system. And I just let it sit there. And maybe once a month or whenever I'm getting ready to do a writing session, I go into that tickler file and I pull out the ideas that still appeal to me. And then from that point, I develop um, a theme of what I want to do, what emotions I want to write about. And I write all this down, believe it or not. And then from that point, I create my poetry. Um, and I will say I do not use a computer beyond the research part. I do uh, research electronically because I can put pocket into my phone and pull it up anywhere that I am. But when I'm doing my actual writing, I write in a paper notebook with a fountain pen. And I think the process of writing from pen to paper actually seems to trigger something in me. It, maybe it's my age, but for me working with pen and paper for poetry at least, um, seems to be where it's at. So that's my writing process. Um, let's see. Uh, Vince, how about you? Would you describe your writing process for poetry? Sure. 
I wanted to just respond to what you said, Wendy, about 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 pen and paper. Um, I almost always write on the computer, and and uh, but but there have been occasions where I was somewhere, and I, you know, and a poem came, and I only had writing utensils, and and it really changes what you do. Um, it changes the rhythm of of the way you think, and yeah. So anyway. Um, well, I will speak about about April. Um, I I write a lot of poems in April. Uh, I do the the poem a day, uh, uh, Napo Rimo National Poetry Writing Month, and and during during that month, um, I will write uh, from the prompts that that are put out by by uh, Robert Lee Brewer uh, and by um, by Maureen. Oh my God, I forgot her last name. <laughs> uh, Maureen Thorson. And, um, um, and so I, I, every year, you know, there's definitely 30, 30 poems there. I mean, they're not always that good, you know, but, but I get maybe 10 poems a year out of that. And in fact, a, a quick, quick blurb, uh, or um, this is my book, uh, uh, The Coolest Month, which is uh, made up of uh, poems uh, all written in April. Uh, for, for those things. So I, I guess that, I guess the bottom line here is that, that I really like working from prompts and I really like merging prompts and trying to write a poem that will satisfy two or more prompts. Cool. Uh, Mary C. Lee, how about you? Well, I think that there are two basic scenarios in which I try and write a poem. And one is the poem is part of a longer project. Um, so for instance, I have written 300, well, it's finished now, but there are over 300 poems that are part of a narrative epic Asian fantasy sequence. And when I was doing that, um, you know, I would think what is a piece of this story that I want to tell and that I'm going to encapsulate into a poem, but I already had the characters and the general setting and so on. And I wasn't starting from nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, actually, it was wonderful. In lots of ways, it was wonderful, but um, it was very different. Um, and, and it's not the only case. So um, I recently completed or have very nearly completed a set of astronomy poetry. And there too, even though it, was, it didn't have a narrative running through it, um, it was still much easier to know what I was going to write about. You know, I. I wrote poems about all the planets and I wrote about light years and I wrote about Galileo and so on. And it was relatively constrained. Um, then the other thing I do is I sit down to write something new that is not related to anything or not intended to be related to a larger project. And then I actually, like Vince, I enjoy writing prompts. I look at a book called The Daily Poet, um, which is by Martha, I'm going to look this up to get it right, Martha Solano and Kelly Russell Agadon. And I don't necessarily, they, they, so they have a prompt for every day of the year. And I don't necessarily, in fact, I'm almost never on the day of the year that they have. I just turn it to the next bit and I look at actually about four of their prompts and I see if they make me feel like I'd write like to actually do one of the prompts as it stands, or if I'd like to alter one of the prompts, but use it as a starting point. Um, or if I don't want to do any of those four prompts, but somehow it's just set my mind off in some direction, because I find it is very hard if you're just thinking, I am going to write a poem. <laughs> I'm going to write a poem in the great poem verse. Um, so um, cats are good too. My cats relax me when I'm going to write poetry. <laughs> and I do end up with a lot of cat poems, but that's okay. <laughs> There's always room for another cat poem in the world. I agree. <laughs> Akua, Leslie Hope, um, could you describe your writing process? Well, I'll say I'm a Gemini, so it's all over the place. And, and I'm also um, the oldest person on this panel. So I've been doing this in every way that's been described, plus another one. My latest um, affection is for speech texture. And so when I find myself um, 
eye fatigue or hand fatigue. I love now dictating and seeing the words appear on the screen. It's been so liberating. And I go from that and I've already got my printout to edit, to inscribe. Um, I'm very, very, very attached to tiny process things like I must use, I don't know if you can see this, I must use my precise V5 for writing because it makes my hand fluid and beautiful on the page. And if it doesn't look fluid and beautiful when I'm all scribbling Hello. on the page. I hate to interrupt you, but unfortunately your, um, yeah, up oh, there we go. Your uh, modem or something is uh, squealing. It's getting hard to hear you. Oh, really? Can yeah, you, could can you, you hear me now? Uh, it, uh, right now it seems quiet. And I'm sorry to interrupt you because oh, oh, always oh. You're, you're giving a wonderful uh, answer. Um, Okay. But I think you, I think you got it. Okay, I, I apologize again. Now? Continue. Is all right. So I was saying that. So I hope you heard what I said about speech texture. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. and uh, about using that and editing it, and also being very very attached to my Pilot Precise V5 for handwriting. So. Um, every room in my home has paper and um, pens, and the bed has a computer, and the desk has a computer. So I use everything that everyone's described. I, so at the foot of the bed is a computer, but I'm, and I'm now sitting at the desk computer. Um, meanwhile, I'm, I'm in a, a wheelchair, and behind me, is both a notepad and a notebook. So I use all, all of those, all of those, because however the muse chooses to strike me, I need to be ready to respond. I've learned that over time. So I'm not even attached to one particular way. And, I, and again, I'm really delighted to have found an oral way to do it um, that's, that tr transcribes it immediately for me. Oh, wow, that's, a, I remember you talking about that before. I'm glad you brought it up again for the panel. Um, anyway, um, I think what we're going to do is move on to our Q&A section of the panel. Um, a few people have submitted some questions into the Q&A section. Okay. And I'm gonna bring up the first one. It's from someone named Miguel Mitchell. And he asks, do you feel that speculative poetry is more freeing of your creative energies than traditional poetry? Um, let's see, I think, Mary, how about you go first on this one? For me, yes, at least it felt that way because as I, the first poems that I wrote that I tried to sell were science fiction and fantasy, but then after my second child was born for reasons that are really unclear to me, I spent almost 10 years where all the poetry I wrote or very nearly all of it was mainstream. And then one summer, about 10 years later, I wrote a few fantasy poems and it was such an immensely gratifying and freeing feeling. And I felt like I was writing something that meant more to me or that, I mean, because I had actually written, that's not quite accurate, because I had written poems about my children that meant a lot to me, but they were, this was just drawing on things that were sometimes subconscious. So I turned out to write quite a lot of Asian themed fantasy and I hadn't planned that and I am only half Asian, so I'd never really felt entitled <laughs> to do so but somehow when I wrote speculative poetry these things felt accessible to me um, and I felt like I was able to so I, I do feel that for me um, speculative poetry has been energizing and almost wonderful as a, as a thing to experience as I'm writing it I don't mean it comes out being wonderful, but the process of writing it compared to writing, I don't know, <laughs> a poem about housework <laughs> is just great. It's okay. Um, uh, Vince, how about you? 
Um, is there something more freeing uh, in your creative energies that comes from speculative poetry as it compared with uh, traditional poetry? Oh, and I think your mic is off. There we go. Don't um, think that speculative, speculative poetry as such is more freeing for me, but, but I certainly in, in concentrating on speculative poetry recently, more than traditional poetry, I've I've gotten more freed up, and so that applies in all my all my work. And Akua, how about you? No, speculative <laughs> is. I don't know. Maybe because I feel I have more to prove in speculative, and so it's more rigorous for me. Whereas, you know, I've been writing poetry all my life, and actually getting affirmed for non-speculative poetry. So speculative poetry is actually um, more challenging for me. And I think I'm, for my, myself, uh, Miguel, I only really write speculative poetry. So it's hard for me to, to compare the two. I think I'd like to write a little more traditional poetry. I have a project in mind um, that is traditional that I'm hopefully gonna get to in the next year or two. Um, but I really like being a speculative poet, but I also write science fiction prose and books too. So for me, it's all kind of work together somehow. But anyway, um, let's move on to another question. This one comes from Richard Lees, I believe is his name. Uh, what can speculative poetry do that maybe speculative fiction cannot? <laughs> Who, uh, Akua, you're laughing. Would you like to go first on this one? I'm laughing because, um, because I also write speculative fiction and I find writing speculative fiction incredibly, incredibly hard. Um, and so if I'm comparing those genres, you know, prose versus poetry, for me, poetry, as I said at the very beginning, it was the first literature, was the first verse, it's how I communicate. So um, I, I love it more, so I can't be objective. I can't give you a, an objective, serious answer. My first voice. That's a good answer too, though. Um, Vince, how about you? And unmic yourself, please. Okay. Um, uh, Maybe the, the biggest difference for me between speculative poetry and speculative fiction is that in, in poetry, there's a lot more attention to, 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 um, to the language, to the art of the words. And so maybe that's something that, that uh, it can do uh, better than, than fiction. Not better, it can do more, <laughs> a more concentrated way. And Mary Sue Lee, how about you? Well, there is a gray line where poetry becomes prose, where it's hard to say which is which. So there is some prose out there. There's some speculative fiction, which is highly poetic and where the language is part of the thing. Mm -hmm. And there's also some poetry, which is pretty unpoetic, um, <laughs> close to prose. And I sometimes write it, not always, but sometimes I'm the person writing that poetry. So, um, so there is a borderline. Uh, but I would say that it, poetry has fewer rules than most fiction, so you can get away with more. And the exception is that a lot of places that take flash fiction also allow for a lot of rule breaking. You don't have to have a conventional narrative structure. It could be a list. It could be strange. Um, so I would say the difference between speculative poetry and flash fiction is smaller than the difference between speculative poetry and most novels, uh, or most speculative novels. Though again, there is this borderline where um, things become poetic. And if you read, let's say you read the Iliad in prose, well, the poetry is gone. Was it a poem? <laughs> you know, was it a poem to you when you read it in English, if it was in a prose translation? So I don't know if it's, except for the fact that perhaps you can break a few more rules. Oh, that's an interesting point of view. I like that. Um, anyway, for me, um, for me, poetry lets me get more uh, in touch with emotion and to really be more, more in, 
more in a specific time and place, whether it's in stories, I, it's more of a river, it's more flowing for me. And for me, that's kind of uh, what poetry does as opposed to what prose does, even though they are somewhat connected too in many ways. Hopefully that's a good answer, I don't know. But, uh, oh yeah, Mary, something Another else? Another thought has just come to me. Uh, so I don't read Chinese, but I've read some of the Chinese classics in translation. And one thing that's interesting is they have a lot more poetry in them. So the text includes, you know, it will just go into a piece of poetry and then back out. Mm. And that isn't as common um, nowadays, but it's kind of nice. Cool, cool. Well, let's see, boy, we still have more questions here. I thank you all in the audience for uh, putting them forward. Um, Flory Fredrickson um, asks, some SFF writers like to write for songs. Do you think that too? What do you think about the relationship between music and poetry? Who would like to go first? They're like this, music yeah. and poetry. They're like this or like this. That's the relationship between music and poetry. And um, I won't do it right now, but sometimes I sing my poems. But I didn't write songs, right? I present the poems with melody. I, I think there's a close relationship too. I mean, for me, when I read my poetry, there's a there's an interior rhythm to the words, and that's the same thing with songs. But of course, I don't do melodies, I, and I don't sing them like Akua does. He, he wouldn't want to hear my voice. <laughs> but um, I, I think there is a connection, but it's it's a looser one. I think there's a point where you cross the line and you become a musician and a songwriter and they are somewhat separated, but they're related. Uh, anyone else? Sure. I, I think that there are poems that are very close to music um, and poems that are very musical in their rhythm, even if they're not song-like, something like Under Milkwood um, by Dylan Thomas or something. It's very musical in its rhythm. Um, but I think there are also things like haiku, which are not really musical to me. Um, or not generally, that's not part of what they're doing. Um, I think it'd be a lot to ask <laughs> for them to go into 17 syllables, be musical and also <laughs> be the haiku-like thing that they are. So um, not always, but sometimes they're close. But, but that's the ones I sing. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, that's so funny that that's the ones you sing. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, we are coming up to the to the end of our panel and just we only have a very short time, like a minute or two. Um, I'd like all of you to introduce yourself or remind the audience who you are and where they can find you. Um, Vince, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I have a blog, uh, The Man with the Blue Guitar which is at vincegoterra.blogspot.com. Okay. Uh, Mary? I have a website, marysoonlee.com, very imaginative. I have a Twitter handle, at marysoonlee, also very imaginative. Um, the website includes a blog about my writing replies <laughs> to rejections and so forth that I've been doing for over 20 years. Um, and I have lots of published things available, some of them on Amazon. Okay, Akua? Speculativepoetry.com for the series and akualesliehope.com to learn about me. And thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you for being here. Thank you for moderating, Wendy. Oh, well, thank you, Mary. Thank oh, and you. just real quick, I'm Wendy Van Camp. You can find me at nowastedink.com. And my Twitter is W Van Camp. And uh, yeah, and thank you all too. I, this has been a wonderful panel. Uh, I appreciate all of you coming and participating. And I, I think we're at the end here. Bye everyone. I should mention the thing tomorrow. We're all reading tomorrow. Oh it? yeah, I, I wanna do that real quick. We are reading, each one of us has our solo um, reading. Akua and myself are, after this yes, panel, mm -hmm. and Lev, uh, rather um, Vince and Mary Sue Lee will be reading tomorrow. Please mm -hmm. look for us in the uh, schedule. We'd be happy to see you over at the Con Suite.
And there's a group reading too. And there is a group reading too tomorrow at um, four o'clock. Four o'clock. Um, please come and find us there. We'll be reading our original work at the panel. Thank you. 